Well, it's been a long drive across the country, across the deserts, across the prairie, throughout the many sites and attractions, then through the woods to eastern Pennsylvania, where I saw my uncle before he took off for cancer treatment this morning, and I left port and hit the road once again and have just arrived at long last in the state of New York. Look at this. It's gorgeous. Out in front of me is Chautauqua Lake. Man, this is a gorgeous spot here in far western New York State. I set out on this road trip without any agenda other than I wanted to see my Uncle Mike. That's the only bullet point that I really had. It's been a completely random adventure. Didn't know if I would end up in the Empire State. I really didn't know if the van was going to make it this far, but luckily I got it back yesterday in running condition. It's still throwing codes and has check engine lights on that are mysterious, but for the moment, it's getting me down the highway. And if we can pull out of this rest stop and it can get me just a little bit further, it should take us somewhere pretty darn interesting. This is Jamestown, New York. It's a pretty town. Not too small, definitely not huge. And important, because it's actually the hometown of my favorite and the most famous female comedian in American history. None other than the legendary Lucille Ball. Now, traveling without a plan has its benefits, like coming here in the first place, but it also has its drawbacks because there's apparently an epic Lucy Desi Museum here. But of course, because I didn't plan ahead, today it's closed. Ugh. All is not lost, however. Because although Lucille Ball spent much of her life in New York City and Beverly Hills, she apparently really loved her little hometown that loved her back. And I mean, come on, let's face it, who doesn't love Lucy? And this is where she chose to be buried. This is Lakeview Cemetery here in Jamestown, New York, and it is huge. I mean, absolutely enormous and old school. It reminds me a lot of cemeteries in France and places like that. I mean, look at the size of this stately grave right here with a huge statue on top, a bunch of people buried in there. I mean, this place is gorgeous. Probably used to be quite a hot spot back in the day for picnicking and such like. It's a little dead now, but I can't hold that against it. I'm pretty sure I came in the wrong gate because I see no sign of Lucille Ball's grave or any markers leading to it. And I heard there were some markers, so I guess I'll wind my way up the hill here and see if I can find Miss Ball's final resting place. Oh, dude, you can't make this up. I just see this grave that says Griswold. And behind it, look what that one says. One too many ladders up the side of the house. All right, now I'm on the right track. Literally, that's the track right there in the middle of the road coming in from the main gate. There's a white line, as my friend Adam would say, festooned with little red hearts with an L in the center. I don't know how far this goes, but uh, I suppose we'll follow the Lucille Brick Road. Ah. Oh, look at this. Ah, this makes sense. Look at, Lucy has her own path leading right towards her tombstone. And boy, what a tombstone. Wow, for some reason I was expecting it to just be Lucille Ball, but there are several other relatives buried in this grave here. Oh, I see. It has Lucille Ball's father, mother, her herself, and her younger brother. How about that? This is crazy. One, it makes giants like Lucille Ball legends. It turns them into real people. Two, it shows that even with all her worldly fame and success, family really mattered to her, which is another humanizing thing. And three, when you see she was buried here in 1989, you realize that was not very long ago. I mean, her children are still around today. I mean, we all think of, Lucy, you got some explaining to do, and all that kind of stuff. But when you come to the grave like this, you realize this is somebody's daughter, sister, mother, and for my money, the funniest woman who ever lived. I love Lucy. I mean, that ugh, that I do, that comes straight from her. I see her mother's maiden name must have been Hunt, and there are several other Hunts over here. So apparently Lucy was buried near all kinds of family. It's pretty wild. I never thought I would be standing next to the grave of Lucille Ball. And man, there are uglier places to be standing. Look at this beautiful cemetery. I've just noticed that underneath her name it says, You've Come Home. That's so sweet. You know, for being a huge fan of Lucille Ball, I actually don't know a lot about her early life. This is inspiring me to do some reading. Too bad the museum is closed. But as huge of an I Love Lucy fan 
as I am, I know an even bigger one, and he is really stoked to be here. Yes, sir, good old Julio is a huge I Love Lucy fan. What do you think, buddy? I know, it's crazy, right? You're gonna have to stop humming that, though, Julio, or it's gonna get stuck in my head. No, I realize a lot of other people must come here and hum that, but uh, now it's in my head, too. All right, Julio. I think we've taken enough time here. We've paid our respects, shown our love to Lucy, and now it's time to be moving on. Except there's one other thing here. Look at this over where you can pull off to park to see Lucille Ball's grave. They've got this, what is that, 50-gallon drum or whatever painted as an I Love Lucy trash can. When I pulled over to park, there were some people that were trying to find Lucy's grave like I was from the other side where there aren't any little red hearts and there's no line. And this little old lady was like, can I ask you something? I think she thought I worked here or something. She goes, why, why is that there? I go, oh, I think it's just so we don't trash the place. But she's looking at how it says I Love Lucy trash can in a graveyard. And she's like, oh, that's in poor taste. Maybe, but I always get excited seeing unexpected things on the side of the road or on the side of some graves. At least it adds a little color. All right, and now onward and eastward. My primary reason for kind of tossing the coin and coming to New York was I figured I didn't start from the West Coast, so I don't need to go all the way to the other ocean, but California to New York has a nice ring to it. Speaking of rings, I hate the door buzzer. Our improvised stereo mount has lasted a long time, still still operational. Just, I'm hoping I can get all the way home so I can get that stupid light off the dashboard. Anyway, time to keep rolling, 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 rolling along. I just pulled over here in the very tiny town of Cuba, New York. A town apparently brimful of murals. But look at this. In all my travels, in all the small towns with murals, I've never actually seen somebody painting a mural. So that's cool. It's definitely one of the perks traveling across America. Seeing all these small towns like this and letting your mind and imagination wander like, what's it like to live here? Dude, that is a sign I've never seen before. It's a bummer because I was literally thinking of pulling over and parking right there. Seemed like a nice spot. But I guess I'll just have to push on. Dude, you know you're not in California anymore when you see Amish buggies in the grocery store parking lot. Or here's an even more unusual sight for me. An old covered bridge. Whoa. Weird. Man. We have a couple in California. It's not none. Particularly some up in Northern California near where Allie grew up. But I guess technically I'm in New England, so this might be my first New England covered bridge. Weird. Not the most impressive one I've ever seen, you know, in a calendar or something. But come on, this is pretty exciting. It is, however, the scene of a tragic accident. Cause look at this. Somebody lost their buggy. No! Uh, yikes. I wouldn't want to drive the van over this, even if it would fit. It's a pretty neat place to stop, even if it is in a gas station parking lot. All right, all right, all right. I'm out of here. Everybody in that last town looked so grim for some reason. Maybe it's the weather. It's making me feel awfully grim and sleepy myself. Just sort of cloudy and bleh. But even though the weather is hardly inspiring to me, the next stop will be if I can make it. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe I'm here. I've also never been more annoyed that I can't roll down the windows and stick my head out. I am now in and driving through Elmira, New York. A town I've legitimately always wanted to visit, even though I know sort of little about it. Well, okay, I know plenty about a piece of its past, but not much about its, uh, you know, current condition. I'm actually sort of getting filled with a little low-grade anxiety. I'm so excited. Because even as the rain threatens to come rolling in, here at Elmira College is something I've waited decades to see. Just across this lawn full of students playing ball is something incredible. Something I can't believe I'm actually getting a peek of already with my own eyes. Something I'm so excited about, I'm actually getting nervous. And I never get nervous. I mean, at least not about stuff like this. Behold, the personal writing study of Mark Twain. I'm actually surprising myself. I'm full of emotion. Like, I almost feel like I want to get choked up. I have been waiting to see this for decades, and I never thought it would happen. For some reason, I just never thought I'd come this way. But I'm here, and it's actually real. I'm here a little late because the little building is actually closed. Apparently, they have Mark Twain ambassadors at the college 
who are here until 4 p.m. and it's like 4.05 right now. Honestly though, it's not very large. There's not much you can't see from outside the windows. Dude, I'm, I'm like shaking a little bit. This is exciting. See, as I'm sure you all know by now, I am a huge fan of Mark Twain. Both his writings and just his life story. I'm sort of an amateur Twain historian sometimes, a Twainiac. And if you're a fan of Mark Twain's literature at all, then this little building will be very important to you as well. In this study, Sam Clemens, AKA Mark Twain, wrote huge portions of the adventures of Tom Sawyer, adventures of Huckleberry Finn, life on the Mississippi, a Connecticut Yankee, in King Arthur's court, and so many other classics. Unbelievable, you'd think he wrote it on the banks of the Mississippi River, Huckleberry Finn, but no, it was inside this little octagonal building. Of course, Mark Twain didn't write it here at Elmira College. He wasn't a college professor. He wasn't even a college man. The study was gifted to the college in the 1950s, nearly 75 years after it was built. It originally stood high on a hill at a nearby farm called Quarry Farm that was owned by his wife's sister. And her husband and family, the Cranes and the Clemenses, would come here from Hartford, Connecticut with the kids in tow and spend the summers and holidays out here. And this little study that was high up on the hills overlooking the river, similar to the river of his boyhood, although not so big, of course, was a gift for Sam. So he'd have some place, you know, private and quiet to write and little did they know what a mighty gift it would be because that view over the river and this little writing hut produced some of the finest American literature, including maybe the great American novel, if you count it as such, Huckleberry Finn. Dude, this is flipping amazing. I don't even care if there's spiders on here. They're Mark Twain spiders, you know. Actually, I can see some spider webs in there. Uh -huh. Ooh, also this, look at this. Was the hand sanitizing station here in Clemens Day, do you think? Dude, this is incredible. That's the original Mark Twain doorknob right there. I feel a little bit less bad now that I showed up after four o'clock because the sign in here says it's only open Memorial Day to Labor Day. So actually I'm not missing anything. It's been closed for a while, thus the uh, cobwebs in there. Some of the glass on this has definitely been replaced, but you can see in person how wobbly it is in other spots and you know that that part is original glass and this whole thing is freaking blowing my mind as a fan of the books as a fan of sam clemens not just mark twain this is surreal man i can't even believe it kind of crazy sam clemens used to sit in there with sheets of paper and a pen and just dash off manuscript pages some of his letters from the time he's like oh i'm making this many words this many pages he was always way over optimistic about how much progress you know he was doing how much road and track he was laying down and then he'd find out dang it I need more material for the book probably smoked one billion cigars in there although as he said he did smoke in moderation I he said make it a rule to smoke only one cigar at a time ironically I don't think you'd be allowed to have a stogie in there today Dude, this is wild. And right next to it, that thing on the ground, that's an original horse watering trough from Quarry Farm, which is still in Elmira, by the way. And in fact, the path that used to lead to the Mark Twain study is still there. But Quarry Farm is now owned, I think, by the college and is run by the Center for Mark Twain Studies. I believe they let people who are studying Mark Twain and writing about him stay at the farm. But normal people like you and me are not allowed except by invitation only. An invitation I did not seek in any way because I did not know I was going to be out here. Now the reason that Mark Twain spent so much time in Elmira, of course, like I said, was his wife's family. His wife's name was Olivia Langdon. Her father, Jervis Langdon, if I'm remembering this all correct off the top of my head and on the spot here, was sort of a coal magnate. He had a lot of money. He was a rich, well-to-do man in a time where breeding and all that was important. Well, when Sam Clemens made that trip to Europe and the Holy Land that ended up being his first book, The Innocents Abroad, he did so with another passenger, Charlie Langdon, who introduced him to his parents in New York, who then invited him to come out here to Elmira and visit the family where he fell in love with their daughter, Olivia, Livy. He was a wild, sort of homeless, blasphemous, uh, unkempt wanderer from the West out here with no 
breeding, no background. He was already being thought of as a brilliant writer, but sort of limited prospects on the horizon, that kind of a thing. And so it was hard for him to win the hand of Fair Maiden, but eventually... He did it right in this town, right in Elmira, New York. That's where he met his sweetheart, who was oh so much younger than him, became part of the Langdon family, the other daughter of which, of course, went and married Mr. Crane and became Susan Crane, built Quarry Farm, built the study for Mark Twain. And this is where some of America's greatest books were born. Dude, right inside of there. It's crazy. I think I'm gonna need a minute over here, but only a minute because we have other stuff to see. Again, if we can make it, I don't know, with the storm coming in and the late time of day, but I just need a minute to sit here and, uh, no pun intended, study a little bit. This is, this is surreal. All right, I guess we gotta hurry out of here. It is going to rain soon, but look at this. There's also an epic statue of Mark Twain on the campus from the 1930s. Pretty cool, that would be very impressive. Very, very impressive if I hadn't just seen Mark Twain's actual study. Uh, I'm almost certain I'm not gonna make it to the next place I'm trying to get to, which is okay. I mean, I can spend the night here, but I'm still gonna try because if that does happen and I have to go try to see it in the morning, I'm gonna have to see it in the rain, so fingers crossed. It's crazy how many people are just driving. Right by the Mark Twain study, it means nothing to them. And how much it means to me. Pretty wild the way that works. Oh dude, I'm pretty sure we're not gonna make it. Still worth a try though, you never know. The internet is often wrong in terms of when things are open. Oh, no way. No way. Pretty sure this is supposed to be closed, but there's a bunch of construction going on. We might just be in luck, at least for a few seconds. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe we made it. This is something I've waited 20, maybe 30 years for. I finally made it to the grave of Samuel Langhorn Clemens, AKA Mark Twain. This is Mind-blowing. This is incredible. There he is up on that plaque right there. And down at the bottom of this memorial here, it says, death is the starlit strip between the companionship of yesterday and the reunion of tomorrow. I believe that was left here by his daughter, Clara, and this was his daughter's husband, whose last name I can never, never pronounce. All around us are the graves of Mark Twain's family, including his daughters, Jean right here, Susie right beside her. Both of them passed away actually before Mark Twain, much to his great sadness. Back there is Clara and her husband. Right here is Olivia Langdon. And this, my friends, is the humble marker, the humble headstone of America's greatest author, Samuel Langhorn Clemens, better known as Mark Twain. Wow. I'm totally speechless. This is so totally weird. I mean, we were just in Hannibal, Missouri, Mark Twain's boyhood home, and Florida, Missouri, his birthplace. And now here we are at his grave. He didn't die here. He died in Connecticut in 1910. He was born roughly when Halley's Comet came through, and he died roughly when it came back. His wife died in Italy, I'm pretty sure, in Florence. One of his daughters, Susie, died at home uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, while the rest of the family was overseas in Europe. That broke Mark Twain's heart. And Jean, who had epilepsy, died, I think, on Christmas Eve, upstairs in Mark Twain's house, just before Christmas. It says, a most dear daughter, her desolate father, sets this stone. Mark Twain stood here, Mark Twain was here, he buried his wife and his beloved daughters here. This is incredible. On the other side, you have the Langdons. Jervis is over here. And his wife is here also. And their children, including Charlie, who was on the Quaker City excursion. In the book, The Innocents Abroad, he's actually mentioned in it. He was the introduction point for Mark Twain to his wife and to his future family. Dude, this is wild. I know normally sometimes I delve into deep history and we do old pictures or wild adventures or theme parks, but I wanted to share this even though I was really unprepared. This is the first and only time I've ever been here. 
and it's a huge deal with me, and who better to share it with than you guys? Oh, here we go. Here's Theodore and Susan Crane, the Crane family I was telling you, that owned Quarry Farm outside of town where we cannot go, but I sure wish we could. It actually remained in the Crane and Langdon families until it was donated to the college for use for studying Mark Twain. That was the condition. So even long, long after Mark Twain was gone, his family still honored and treasured his memory, which is uh, quite an endorsement, I think. Jervis Langdon and his wife, Olivia, they were big time abolitionists. I believe they were participants in the Underground Railroad, and this family went a long way towards erasing Mark Twain's hmm, boyhood prejudices, or the things he was raised with, really. Cementing him firmly and forever in the anti-slavery camp, in the pro-equality camp, if you will, and leading to one of the greatest anti-racist novels of all time, Huckleberry Finn. I'm so glad we made it here tonight, before it rains, because it is going to pour tomorrow, and my plan was to drive as far out of here as I could before that happened, so it looks like I'm gonna head on down the road. <laughs> I'm so happy, right? I'm so, this was just simple luck. I didn't even know I was coming to New York until this morning. I literally flipped a coin. My uncle is off to radiation treatment. I hugged him goodbye, then I forgot my sunglasses, came back and hugged him goodbye again, and I was feeling all emotional and frustrated, and let's just put it this way, I, I needed this, a bucket list thing for me checked off. Even Julio's keeping his distance over in the van from this one. He wanted to give me a little space. Oh, I didn't even see this. This was Mark Twain's only grandchild, Nina. She died in Hollywood in 1966. Crazy. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation that his daughter Clara had an illegitimate child, so there's people out there who claim to be descended from Mark Twain, but never been any proof. So this is where his family lies. The rest of his family, the Clemens family, they're all in Hannibal, Missouri. Well, except for the one sister, Margaret, whose grave we visited in Florida. Florida, Missouri, that is. This, this was his family as an adult. This was his family in. This is crazy. All right, I'm gonna need a minute alone here, guys. This is wild. I am a long way from home, all the way from California to New York to see this. And I think this might be at least northwise uh, the high water mark for us because we lost more than a week to the van, uh, the different repairs and stopping for the different shops. Thankfully, we lost that time in Hannibal, Missouri, where I got to revel in some Mark Twain history. And then at my uncle's house, where I got to spend a lot of time with him telling old stories. I'm still hoarse. We did enough talking for two weeks worth of visit. Anyway, guys, the cemetery was closed when I drove in. I know they're cutting down trees over there, doing whatever they're doing. I don't think I'll be locked in, but it's probably time to go. I do want to return. I really want to go to Quarry Farm. So if anybody ever has the hookup for that, please let me know. You can email me or whatever. Or leave a comment on Instagram. Instagram, who had ever thought we're talking about Instagram? Mark Twain would have never known what that was. Could he even conceive of Instagram? What would he think if he opened the Explore page? Whoa. If we ever come back, which I hope we will, we'll get to see Quarry Farm. We'll see the inside of the study because I'll, I'll actually plan things out better. And we can talk about the lamentable, sad tale of Mark Twain losing his whole family. Look at that beautiful headstone right there. But for now, we've seen all we can see today. So I think, since I've checked something off the bucket list, We've done our duty. We can go home and sleep well. Mark Twain spider. I told you they were real. Turns out I do mind them. <laughs> Ooh, 
Here's a fun turn of events. 40 miles an hour only in second gear because the D don't work. I'm gonna go as far as I can. See what happens.